Hi, welcome to Covenant Bible Fellowship tonight as we finish up our uh, study in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, we started it last time. We did not get all the way through the chapter, so we're just going to be basically finishing out the chapter tonight. If you don't already have your Bible open, um, go ahead and flip to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to be starting with verse 26. So that's Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. Again, welcome, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Lord, thank you so much for giving us one more chance to dive into your scripture, to, to look at what the, uh, the truth is, and to help to try to, to learn something, to glean something from your field. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to go home with a nugget. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, let's go ahead and get your, your uh, Matthew chapter 10 open. Uh, and then we will move from uh, verse 26 on today. So, last week, uh, we were talking about, all the way up through verse 25, we were talking basically about the fact that, uh, you know, we're going to have power, uh, but we're also going to be persecuted. There's going to be a lot of, um, of resistance to the message that we have. And that kind of culminates there in verse 25 by the Lord reminding us uh, that, you know, the disciple is as his master, uh, the disciple is not greater than his master, right? So um, basically what he's saying is, you know, I got, I got flack for doing what was right, so you're definitely going to get flack for doing what's right. Um, verse 26 sort of is a, a, a change. It's a little bit of a shift, uh, and that's why we save that and the rest of, of this, um, this chapter for this week. Uh, so it starts out in verse 26 by saying, Fear them not, therefore, for, where is nothing, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. Now, I, I want to point out that the therefore is pretty important, right? Because it beckons back to what we were talking about last week. It's, it's referencing this whole thought of us not having to worry about being, as in verse 16 it says, sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And that sounds pretty terrifying, right? Um, and so it's something that definitely is a warning. And I was talking last week about how much of a warning he's providing us as he goes through this, to, to, to recognize, you know, be cognizant of the fact that you're going to have resistance. You're going to have, um, be it on a large scale or a small scale. I mean, uh, to give you an example, you know, I have faced resistance personally um, in the workforce, in uh, just, you know, in friendships, um, in different circles and communities, simply because of my faith. Um, now, a lot of the resistance that I've faced has been because of my personality. That's not something that you can throw on God, right? That's something that, that you know, that's all you. Um, but when you are facing resistance because of your faith, um, that's something where you can basically point to, to God on that, and he will, he will support you. So that's something that you're going to get, even on the small deal like I have gotten. Um, but it, there's a potential, of course, for it to be on a, on a much larger scale. Um, there have been all the way up to and including torture and death. Now, I don't like to talk about that because that's not a really positive subject. Um, but the fact is that, in, as it says in verse 21, brother shall deliver up the brother to death, the father, the child, the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. This is not necessarily a light subject, right? This is a tough thing. It's a warning that the Lord's given us. But he says in verse 26, fear them not, therefore, right? And that therefore is important, remember, because who is the them? We're talking about the world. These are all, everybody that's going to be resisting us. We're not talking about the devil. We're talking about the world here. Fear the world not because, you can almost translate it that way, because there's nothing that's covered that will not be revealed and nothing that's hid that will not be known. And that's the, the translation of Josh, so that's not exactly what it says. But essentially what he's saying is you don't have to worry about what the world is doing 
because it is not going to be under cover of darkness. It's not going to be hidden. It's going to be exposed. Um, and, and he goes on to follow that same thought in verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, what ye hear in the ear, that preach you upon the housetops. Uh, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Once again, this is not a very um, happy thought, right? But at the same time, this is an important thought because essentially what he's saying is, uh, you know, when the other team commits a foul, you don't need to fear the other team for committing the foul, right? You need to fear the umpire. You need to fear the, the judge. You need to fear the, um, the, the person whose job it is to call them on it because it doesn't matter how secret they think they're being. When they commit the foul, the, the divine judge knows, right? He's going to be able to call them on it. So we don't have to fear the world even though we know that they're not going to play fair, even though we know that they're going to do all sorts of, of stuff on the, from the very smallest of things where they simply don't allow you into their social circles, right? And that kind of hurts you in the heart. But just trust me, it's okay. You know, uh, the Bible says that if you're the friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. Um, so don't worry about it. But from the smallest of things all the way up to and including you know, fathers turning against children and, and sending them to the death. So they're, they're, that's some pretty hefty stuff, right? But all of that is included in, they committed a foul, don't you worry about it, I've got you, right? So there's an underlying promise of God's support, and it's not support necessarily that you're going to see in this life, and that's something that's misinterpreted a lot of times, because he's not saying that the father won't turn over his son, right? He's saying that he will. He's not saying that the world isn't going to be hard, or that life isn't going to be hard, um, what he's saying is that God is watching, that God knows, that you know that justice is coming. Um, and so there, the promise here is one of an eternal security. All right, And I'm not saying that in the, the um, light of the hard questions, eternal security, like is connected with, you know, the whole Calvinism versus Arminianism thing. I'm, I'm talking about the idea of we are secure in God not necessarily in this life where he's going to block bullets for us, right? But in the next life. I'm not saying he's not going to. He may. God is an awesome God, and he does all sorts of things, right? He, he um, was obviously behind a number of uh, victories throughout history, including but not limited to the American Revolution uh, and the Seven Days War, if you're, if you're interested in history and you'd like to look that up. It's the, um, the battle back in the, the middle of the 19th uh, century. Maybe I said that wrong, but the 1900s, uh, back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, something like that, where um, Israel basically beat everybody in seven days when they had everybody uh, team up against them. So that's, that's a fascinating thing to look at. But God is perfectly willing to do it in this life, but there's no promise that God's going to block every bullet that's thrown in your direction uh, or that you'll never put up with any discrimination for your faith or anything like that. The promise is that in the next life, you're going to come out ahead, all right? You don't have to worry about whether or not justice will be done. Those who do good are going to be rewarded. Those who do bad are going to be punished, and it's an absolute fact, right? So we can take that we can, we can take that to the bank. So that's why we don't have to fear. And it, he goes on again to, to uh, support that point in verse 28 when he says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pull out uh, that verse, verse uh, 28, and we're going to look at what that fear really means. So the fear there is phobio, as in the basis of a phobia, all right? It's a terrified, it's a dread, um, it, it's like, you know, me and spiders, it's, it's a not happy thing. Um, but it includes this connotation, or a potential anyway, of being terrified to reverence. Um, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, when we say phobia, what we mean is not exactly the same as the Greek word phobio, all right? It's very close, and it looks very close and sounds very close, but when, what we mean in English society when we say phobia is talking about uh, a fear that is not 
it's, it's not sustained by facts necessarily, right? It's a, it's a fear like um, when I was a kid, I didn't like going out into open spaces. My, my mind would go on wild flights of fancy and I would imagine gravity turning off. And if I'm not close enough to a tree to grab onto something, I might fly away forever, right? So there were, therefore I was afraid of outside. Obviously we don't have to fear that. that that's something that would never happen. So therefore, eh, right? Um, but at the same time, a fear that is a legitimate concern, like for instance, I am, I'm not okay with, uh, jumping out of airplanes without a, a parachute. All right. I, I would definitely have a fear of that, a terror of that. Um, I'm not okay with looking down the, the muzzle of a, of a gun, right? This is something that I may have been a trained fear because I understand what a gun does. Um, but it's a fear nonetheless. It is not a phobia because it's one that makes sense. It's a rational fear um, in the English psychological sort of way. But it does apply here with this Greek verb. It is phobio, right? It is this reverence, all right? I'm, I'm not worshiping the gun, but I respect the gun. I, I'm not going to muzzle anybody with the gun because I've been taught correctly. I had gun safety classes, and I know that if I point a gun at a person, that is tantamount to threatening them, even if I'm just kind of waving the gun around wildly because I'm not paying attention. It's because if the gun goes off, guess what? The business end is the business end, right? So there's some reverence there, and it causes me to control my actions, right? It's the same thing when I'm going rock climbing. I know that I have to know that I've tied my harness correctly, or perhaps I'm using a professional harness. I know that I need to inspect my ropes correctly. I know that the person who's on belay needs to know what they're doing on belay, and that I need to know what I'm doing, because if I'm doing this, I have a reverence. I have a fear, but it's a justified fear, and it controls my actions. It dictates my actions. It enforces in me the importance of doing this correctly, doing this by the book, following the rules, not because the rules are restrictive and I'm being legalistic, but because I understand that if I point the gun in the wrong direction or I don't have anybody on belay that, you know, or, or you know, I, I'm, I didn't tie my harness correctly, I could die, right? So this is a legitimate concern. And so the fear that we're putting here in, in uh, Matthew chapter 10 is a legitimate concern. This is a legitimate fear. Uh, and, and he's saying fear, uh, phobio, not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather phobio, right? Him which is able to destroy both body, our soul and body in hell. He's saying there is a legitimate concern which should govern your actions here because there is a, an issue. There's a, a, um, uh, a real danger that's even more important than death. All right. And we know that that's the case. If, if you know anything about the Bible, you should understand that sin could send you to hell and Jesus's death is what saves us from that. Right. That's the basis of the gospel. That's what the good news is, is guess what, buddy? You don't have to go to hell anymore. Um, so knowing this, we can read into this entire passage that we were looking at last time as being put your stuff in perspective. Okay, I've given you power here on this earth in order to accomplish your mission. You're going to have people fight against you, but don't worry about that. Even if they torture you and kill you, it's not that important because the things that really matter are the soul. All right, this is a perspective building argument, if you will. This is pointing you to the, to the, to the uh, idea, to the concept of the most important thing in life and beyond is your soul. That's what matters. That's what is the quintessential element, if you excuse my use of, of Greek philosophy. And if you're not familiar with that, I'll explain that really briefly. But um, the Greek philosopher, uh, I believe it was Aristotle? I'm not sure. I might be wrong on that. But he said that there were five elements. And of course, we figured out now that the there are a lot more than five elements, right? We have a periodic table of elements. Um, but he, he had these five elements. I believe it was ether, um, so there's earth and fire and water, right? Uh, but the quintessential element, the element that pulls it all together, the quint as in five uh, essential, the one that, that must be there is spirit, he said. And so that's when we say quintessential today, we're actually talking about, we're using a, a term that was initially meant to be spirit. So, um, you know, if you can excuse me, kind of pulling on a little bit of that, the quintessential element here, the thing that really pulls it all together uh, is, again, 
the soul. That's the thing that's the most important. That's what our focus is supposed to be on. Where are you going eternally? That's the issue. So when, when we're looking at, you know, is God going to provide food? Is he going to provide raiment, right? That's what we were looking at um, earlier in Matthew, um, where, where he says, you know, um, don't worry about what you can put on your body, you know, is, is not... Uh, the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Um, so in this in this passage, he's building on that thought to say, you know, it's not this life that matters, it's the next one. It's not a temporary life that matters, it's an eternal life. It's not temporary pain that matters, it's eternal pain, right? And so at the same time, it's not a temporary reward that matters, it's an eternal reward. Uh, but he does this from the perspective of fear for a reason. And I'm going to, excuse me, show you what I mean by that. So he says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Now, isn't that just a positive thought? And I don't mean that sarcastically. I mean that very, very straightforwardly. It's a very positive thought. We are of value. We are of value. And this is something that, that's overlooked a little bit, but um, what he's saying with this fear is that the basis of our fear comes from a, a different value uh, perspective. When we judge ourselves based on human matters, when we judge ourselves based on human perspective, then we try to place our own value on us, all right? And we do this often. Um, I, I find myself doing it all the time. You know, am I smarter than this person? You know, am I more accomplished than that person? Am I making more money? Do I have a prettier wife? The answer to that is yes. No, I'm just joking. Um, do I have, you know, good food to eat and all these kind of things? These are interesting questions, right? Uh, am I fulfilled? Am I happy? Uh, and, and, but all of these questions end up bringing me to a perspective. I'm talking about me now, but if this, if this, you know, fits for you, then apply it. If the shoe fits, wear it. But um, all, all of these questions end up bringing in this sort of underlying comparison. And of course, scripture tells us that if you that compare yourself with another person, you're not being very wise, right? It says that the person who compares themselves by themselves and among themselves are not wise. So it's kind of a foolish thought, but it's a thought of, you know, okay, I'm making enough money to survive, but I'm not making as much money as my brother right? Um, I have a car that gets me to work, but it doesn't drive as smoothly as that, guys. Uh, and the comparison sort of sours everything. Um, and and it, you know the saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. So we have the wrong value judgments of ourselves, and we try and, we, we try and see that we measure up against the world. You know? And I say, well, I'm a pretty cool guy. I'm a pretty smart guy. Uh, I'm a pretty handsome guy. I make a decent amount of money, I dress all right, I have a car that drives, I have a house to live in, you know, these are all positive things so I can feel good about myself because, you know, at least I'm doing that well. And all of that may be true, but I'm still doing that as a value judgment of myself. I'm placing value on myself. I'm trying to define my own value. There was never an item in any store ever that got to set its own price tag, all right? We don't define our own value. God defines our value. So what he's saying here is, you know, don't fear others. The reason why you're fearing others and you're fearing the world is because you're placing your own value judgments. I'm the one who's in control of this all. And if you understand that I'm in control of this all, and you understand your eternal soul is the thing that matters the most, then you should understand your value is dictated by God. And since your value is dictated by God, the result is dictated by God. If your value could be dictated by you, then it's up to you. You know, all these other factors have to be factored in. You have to know it all. You have to be on top of the heap. But we don't, right? That's, that's unimportant. It's, it's irrelevant. All the other value judgments don't matter. So he says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? One of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Hmm. Now, the value judgment that God makes, I'm going to point this out as well, uh, is it, it is how much of a difference can you make? You know, there's a, a theory that if you could go back in time, 
right? And you do go back in time and you change the fluttering of a single butterfly's wings that it could change all of history, right? It's called the butterfly effect. I personally don't believe in that theory. I, I subscribe to a different theory. And my theory is that um, time is pretty self-healing. So if I went back in time and kept two people from ever meeting that were supposed to have an important child, uh, that some other child would end up being the important child and history would move forward, right? Um, or, or they'd meet in another way. I don't know. But history, I think, would probably fix itself because we have a grand designer and his design will, will not be thwarted. Um, but that being said, that's what this is talking about, is your ability to make a difference. Your ability to make a difference. If, if a sparrow died in the woods and fell on the ground, is not going to have that big of a difference on history. But God still is paying attention to it. God still cares about the sparrow. The sparrow has a place in God's plan. Think about that now. Every sparrow that's ever lived, every single bird or bee that's ever lived has had a place in God's plan. And if they die, it doesn't change that much. If you die, you're worth a lot more, right? That's what he's saying. You're of more value than many sparrows. So it's something that, that can really give you a, a bolstering, you know, a, a support when you're, when you're worried about this life. This life isn't the one that matters. These value judgments aren't the ones that matter. It does not matter whether the world is going to cut you down, whether they're going to discriminate you, against you and make you lose your job. Uh, you know, all of the things that we worry about, Forget it. Not that important when you compare it to eternity and the fact that your value is set by God, not by what you've done or what you can do. It's, it's set by God. As I'm beating a dead horse here, so we'll move on. Uh, verse 32, it says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Uh, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Hmm. <laughs> so if, if anyone wants to, um, uh, this whole section that we're talking about kind of mirrors the chapter uh, 12 of Luke. Uh, it, it has a very similar section about fearing only God, uh, which would be Luke 12, 4 through 7. Uh, and then it also has a section in uh, 8 through 12, which is talking about the fact that, you know, we confess Christ. Uh, that mirrors very nicely with uh, verses 32 and 33 here. Um, but the gist of this section, if I could give you any nugget that I've gotten out of it, uh, is that we need to be vocal. Um, we can't be closet Christians. We have to fear God more than man. Uh, and, and again, this is building on the previous, and I've told you, you know, before that when Jesus talks, he builds one topic upon the next, upon the next, upon the next. It's a logical progression. It moves in one solid direction. Uh, and this is no exception. He's building on the previous thought. Don't fear the world. Fear God instead. This is an uh, honest respect that dictates your actions. This is a, I know where the muzzle of my gun is pointed. This is a, I'm going to make sure my parachute is packed right. This is a, I, I'm going to know that the person below me knows how to put me on belay, right? Um, so therefore, since we have a legitimate respect, fear of God more than man, it follows, logically, to put this in a syllogism, it follows that we should care more about what God wants us to talk about than what man wants us to talk about. And therefore, if man doesn't want us to talk about God, but God does want us to talk about God, we need to talk about God. And I'll tell you straight up, God wants you to talk about God. All right, He says so often. So this is just one example of that. Then... Um, if you skip a little bit in Luke 12, you skip down to um, uh, about verse 49, I believe, and, and to the end of the chapter, um, it's going to be this same section as uh, verses 34, 35, and 36 here in Matthew chapter 10. Um, but it's talking about the fact that there is a division. There is a war going on between God and the world. Um, and when you are 
willing to actually, you know, when you put your money where your mouth is, when you're, when, when your faith in God brings you to the point where you have an honest respect and fear of God, you're not just playing with toy guns anymore. This is a real gun. You're not just talking about going and, and, and repelling off the side of a, uh, of a skyscraper. You're actually doing it. You know, when you've moved to the point where you have that honest respect and fear, that true understanding of the immensity of dealing with the all powerful God, uh, and it's turned into action so that you're talking to people, you're going to make them angry. They're not going to like it. They're not going to like you, right? He's already warned this uh, us about this before. He warned us about this back in verse 24 that we were talking about last week, where he says that uh, if they've called the, ma or 25, if they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household, right? So he's saying, that this is not going to be easy. And he goes back and reiterates that when he says, um, think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be of his own household. Now, this is a hard thing. This is a really hard thing. So I want you to listen up, but I, I want you to take this not just with a grain of salt, but I, I want you to take this, you know, with some introspection. Um, but that means you're going to have fights with your family. All right. You're not going to see eye to eye with everything that your parents or your brothers and sisters or your children or whoever else it is in your family believes. There's going to be things where one of you is going to believe one way, the other is going to believe the other way. All right. And we need to show grace. We need to not be a bigger enemy to our own family than the world is. But even at that, if you have someone in your family, and any of you who do will know exactly what I'm talking about, but if you have someone in your family that is uh, an unbeliever, it becomes one of the hardest things for you, especially family get-togethers and things like that. It just runs through your mind constantly. It's like, I love this person. They're my family. I would do anything for them. I'll go help them out. But I know that it's temporary because as soon as they die, it's all over. I'm never going to see them again. And that's tough. And it pushes you to a little bit more of a, a, a mama bear perspective. You want to protect them. You want to take them under your wing. You want to do everything you can to help them out. I mean, it's one thing to have that sort of love for the world where you know you have to go out and it puts a fire on your belly to go talk to people. But it's something else when it's your own brother. You know, it's your own sister. When it's your own child. It, it really makes it, it really brings it close to home. And it really makes it something that, that hurts in a special way. You know, as Christians, it's as close as we get to the fear of death that most of the world has. We don't fear it for ourselves. We fear it for our family members. But we really do truly understand that at any moment, that family member could be eternally gone. So it's, it's really tough. And it kind of, it brings ahead to the discussion. It makes it, you know, that, that war, that labor, if you will. Um, that's why a lot of people refer to this passage as the sword of the gospel. It, it cuts deep. As verse 36 says, a man's foes shall be of his own household. Verse 37, he picks up, he says, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Tough words. But sometimes it is important for us to take a stand. It's important for us to be known. It's important for us to step out into the danger zone and do something risky, even if it causes us to lose the relationship that we have with our brother, with our family member, with a loved one. And the reason for that is not just to cover ourselves. It's not necessarily out of fear in a generic sense. 
If you've been following along this whole time, you'll remember fear is what? Something that dictates your actions because it's common sense. It, it is something that makes you really want to act. If I saw my own brother hanging out over the edge of, you know, an abyss, just kind of singing as he leaned backward, just enjoying himself, completely oblivious to the fact that he's about to die, I'd go nuts. But the fact is I'd go nuts just, just about anybody that way. You know, I don't want to see anybody die. But with my own brother, I would go nuts. I'd do anything I could to get him back. If you're too afraid to talk to people, you're not going nuts. You're sitting there going, eh, I guess he's enjoying himself. I don't want to lose my relationship with him. You're going to lose your relationship with him if he dies. You're going to lose your relationship with her if she dies. Permanently. That's the fear that should be in your belly. It's not a self-preservation fear. It's another preservation fear. And it's a love. It comes from love. It would be much better for you to talk to him now. Anyway, verse 40. So he says, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. That's going to be where we're going to close tonight. We do have rewards for service. It's not all doom and gloom. We have to remember that God knows, right? God's the one who places the value. God's the one who controls all of this. And our rewards are set in stone. We in no wise lose our reward. You know, the Bible that I'm using for this references 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. It's the passage talking about the Shunammite woman and Elisha. When he went and she did something small, but she did something for him. And um, because of that, the prophet says, hmm, I should do something for her. What do you think we should do? And Gehazi says, um, well, she doesn't have a child. So he calls her. And he says, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season. God gives rewards. And his rewards aren't always in heaven. His rewards can be here on earth too. His protection isn't always in heaven. It can be on earth as well. But we need to remember to be heavenly minded. So that's going to be the end of Matthew chapter 10. Next week we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 11. Please read it beforehand if you can. Get ready to go on that. Um, and if you have any questions, now would be the time for those questions, but otherwise we're going to close in prayer. Uh, and I look forward to meeting with you all again next week as we look at Matthew chapter 11 uh, and take a look at some of the interesting things that, uh, that happen <laughs> with, with John. So um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for giving us a, a glimpse at the... Um, the future, but also at priorities, at remembering to keep our focus where it needs to be. Help us to be uh, heavenly minded, but to also remember to keep our, our uh, eyes on the road, as it were, um, and uh, to pay attention to those that are around us, and to be, to be those who are in so much love with you that we can have a proper fear as well, a respect uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with God.